Welcome to our virtual program on the past, present, and future of U.S.-India relations. This event marks the 75th anniversary of India's independence. It's also the third of four programs of our Naren Gupta tribute series. We are thrilled to have Ambassador Jester with us from New York and Professor Raja Mohan, our moderator, joining us from Delhi. Welcome to our Northern California board members, advisory council, groundbreaker and innovator members, and the members from our 14 centers around the world. I'm Margaret Conley, the executive director here in San Francisco. And for today's format, I'll introduce our speakers. They'll have a moderated discussion, and then we're going to open the floor to audience Q&A. So please have your questions ready. Go ahead and type your questions in the Q&A box at any time. We'll get to as many questions as possible. We have an hour for this program. We'll finish at 7 p.m. in San Francisco. That's 10 p.m. in New York and 7.30 a.m. in Delhi. This event is on the record and we are recording. The video will be available on our website in about a week. And for those joining our VIP reception, have that second Zoom link that was emailed to you ready at the end of the program and we'll have a off the record conversation with our speakers. Our bios for our speakers are on our website and I will start with a few words about our guest speaker, Ambassador Kenneth Juster. He has over four decades of experience as a senior government official, law partner, and business executive. He is senior counselor at Freshfields, Bruckhaus, and Deringer. He was deputy assistant to the president for international economic affairs and deputy director of the, Inter of the National Economic Council. And he served as the ambassador to India from 2017 to 2021. Our moderator is Professor Raja Mohan. He is our new senior fellow with the Asia Society Policy Institute in Delhi, which is in partnership with our center in Mumbai, and that officially launches this week. He is a visiting research professor at ISIS, the Institute for South Asian Studies at the National University of Singapore. He is the founding director of Carnegie Delhi in, in Carnegie India in Delhi. He's been involved in several think tanks in India, served on India's National Security Advisory Board, and he is a widely published journalist. Professor Mohan, I will hand this off to you. Thank you so much for doing this. Thank you. Thank you, Margaret. And uh, uh, let me begin by thanking the uh, Asia Society Northern California for organizing this uh, event. Uh, this is really a very, as they say in India, auspicious week for us. I mean, uh, we're launching the Asia Society Policy Institute presence in Delhi in the next few days. Uh, we have uh, Kevin Rudd, the president of Asia Society here in, in Delhi uh, this next few days. Uh, so it's really a, a good moment uh, as we celebrate the 75th anniversary of uh, India's independence. Uh, we're also going to have uh, widen the Asia Society's footprint uh, in India. Uh, and it's also wonderful to be with uh, Ambassador Ken Jester, uh, who has been part of the growth of the, uh, of the relationship in the last uh, couple of decades. So uh, he knows uh, perhaps uh, the, the complexities and the, the progress and the problems uh, in the relationship like very few other people uh, in, in either country. Uh, so let me begin by giving you in a very, very brief, one of those American style uh, brief histories of the, uh, of the, of the relationship. Uh, you can think of the India-US uh, relationship in, in uh, two parts at least. Uh, you had the first part, the, the, the Cold War and the pre-independence period. Uh, in fact, uh, in India, there was, uh, though we had very little contact with the United States, the presidency of uh, FDR, uh, who began to talk about uh, the importance of decolonization, uh, extraordinary, generated extraordinary enthusiasm in India uh, that uh, FDR uh, would be a champion of India's independence in the final phase of uh, the independence uh, struggle. Uh, but unfortunately, I mean, uh, Roosevelt uh, could not prevail over Winston Churchill. Uh, and uh, in so that's that uh, really, I mean, there was a disappointment in India. And that laid the basis for many of the uh, later disappointments uh, that, you know, 81 years ago this month in the Atlantic Charter, Roosevelt did introduce uh, the, the question of uh, decolonization and freedom for the uh, people who are uh, in colonialism. Uh, but uh, Churchill would not... Uh, go with it, uh, although it was written in there, he made it clear that that does not apply to, to, to India. And then we have the Cold War, uh, in which three broad factors constrained the relationship. Uh, one was India's economic orientation that diverged from the, the American uh, uh, system, and it became increasingly difficult to build a, an economic partnership. The Cold War uh, created conditions under which India and the US were really ranged on the opposite sides uh, of the international uh, uh, situation. And within the region, 
the contradictions between U.S. policies uh, towards Pakistan and China and India's relationship with the Soviet Union uh, and uh, created their own sets of problems. Uh, so we really couldn't, despite the best efforts or occasional uh, serious moves by either side, uh, we could not make much progress till the Cold War ended. Uh, and after the Cold War came to an end uh, in 1991, uh, we've seen uh, uh, extraordinary transformation uh, of this relationship. The 1990s, uh, there were a few problems. For example, uh, the question of uh, you know nuclear non-proliferation and other issues that constrained the relationship. But from President Clinton's visit to India in 2000, and especially under the George W. Bush administration, uh, we saw a, a rapid, dramatic, and significant transformation uh, of the relationship. In fact, I would dare say, at least for India, the, the, the change relationship with the US is probably the most significant one in the last 20 years. And perhaps for the United States as well, uh, barring Central Europe, uh, what Americans say, New Europe, uh, the growth in the relationship with India too has been one of the most important <clears throat> changes in the US international relations. And to talk about the change and the current context and where we might go with it, uh, we have uh, Ambassador Ken Jester. Welcome, uh, uh, Ambassador. And uh, you've been involved uh, through multiple administrations uh, in the last few, uh, last couple of decades uh, in Commerce Department, later in the National Security Council, then as Ambassador to India. Uh, are you surprised in, re in reflection? I mean, that, that we've been able to construct this relationship, <clears throat> you know, in the, in the great changes that have taken place, uh, starting from such a such a complex uh, moments uh, before. Uh, so, how did we get to this bipartisan cooperation on both? You know, there was bipartisan consensus on both sides. Uh, so, what are the factors that led to the change in the relationship? Is it structural change in the international environment in India's economic orientation? Is it because the leaderships in both countries were deeply committed? Uh, but we also had problems with the bureaucracies in both the countries, which are deeply suspicious of each other. So what, how would you characterize the factors that really transformed this bilateral relationship in the last two decades? Well, thank you very much, Raj. It's a great pleasure to be here for the Asia Society program. I've been a long admirer of the Asia Society and also of you, Roger Mohan. And we've had a friendship for, I think, 20 years now uh, uh, on uh, uh, focusing on U.S.-India relationship, but going beyond that uh, as well. And, you're regarded in my country as one of the great strategic thinkers in India and someone who has also been a player in the process here. Uh, and your question is a, a great one because people now may look at the U.S.-India relationship and think it was inevitable that it would be a close relationship, and yet it was anything but inevitable. And you mentioned a variety of different factors that have contributed, but if you go back to as you said, the visit of President Clinton, and then later the real transformation that took place during the administration of George W. Bush. I think leadership, uh, first and foremost, played a key factor in this. Uh, uh, President Clinton was interested in India. He wanted to travel during his presidency. It got postponed for a variety of reasons, including the nuclear tests, uh, but he ultimately did travel to India in, in 2000. But there was still obstacles, especially related to the nuclear issue that were uh, not able to be overcome. Uh, President Bush came into office with the simple idea that the world's oldest democracy, the United States, and the world's largest democracy, India, should have a better relationship. It seems so self-evident. And he also felt that India is going to, by its sheer size and its economic growth, going to be a strategic player in Asia, and the United States should have a strong relationship with it, and a strong U.S.-India relationship, and a strong India was ultimately in our interest. Uh, and so he really wanted to push forward the relationship, and I was fortunate to be among those involved in his administration. Uh, I think the, the big transformative idea was the civil nuclear deal which was concluded during the second term of his administration. The discussions began with the Vajpayee administration in India and continued with Mohan Mahan Singh. But to get there, we had to overcome a lot of hesitations, including bureaucracies that each doubted the reliability 
uh, of the other. We uh, began a high technology cooperation group that built up uh, some confidence between the two sides as India wanted to gain further access to US technology and the United States wanted India to enhance its export controls and security around that technology. This led to the next steps in strategic partnership initiative that laid out a progressive set of steps for cooperation in uh, high technology, civil nuclear issues, civil defense issues, uh, and other areas. Uh, and that gradually then led to the civil nuclear deal. Uh, but I think the key signal was from the leadership at the top, and it took President Bush and uh, Prime Minister Singh to push through that nuclear deal. Uh, I think over time, uh, the issue of China and the uh, broader structural interest that each side has has contributed. There were certainly, at the outset, uh, some people who saw the U.S.-India relationship from the U.S. perspective as a way to hedge against what might happen with China. But at that time, the United States had a very strong relationship with China. We helped China get into the World Trade Organization. We were working closely with it on a range of uh, initiatives. Uh, I can't speak for what may have been the motivations within India, but it was not driven in 2000, 2001, 2008 by China as much, I think, as by leadership, but the China issue is certainly not absent. Uh, but over time, as China has risen further uh, in the region and has become more aggressive and more expansionist, that has certainly galvanized the uh, efforts to strengthen the strategic partnership and even expand to revitalizing the quadrilateral uh, grouping with uh, India, the United States, Japan, and Australia. And the pace of uh, the uh, strategic partnership and the Quad's efforts has certainly been accelerated due to uh, Chinese activity uh, in the region globally. I'd mentioned two other factors that I think have been important in the evolution of the relationship. Uh, one, uh, below the leadership, there has been a cadre of officials uh, in both governments that have been dedicated to pushing this effort forward. And when that cadre has not been active, sometimes the relationship has slid a little and not made progress because we had uh, bureaucracies that uh, were not oriented in a positive way toward each other by and large. And you needed people at the sub-cabinet level to really push uh, to get things done. Ambassador Bob Blackfeld was a, was a key player also in the strategic vision uh, for the relationship. Uh, Minister Jay Shankar at one point was the Joint Secretary for the Americas and played a key role. Foreign Secretaries, uh, Sham Saran, Conwell Sibyl. So there are a variety of individuals who along the way helped push this relationship forward. The other factor I'd mention is the Indian diaspora. Uh, the number of Indian Americans has grown exponentially. We now have over 4 million, and that's provided a real glue to the relationship. And as that uh, number of Indian Americans has grown, uh, so has their political clout within the United States, and most importantly, with the US Congress, which initially, I would say, was skeptical of the US-India relationship, but now uh, members of Congress are among the biggest cheerleaders of that relationship. There are other factors that have also contributed along the way, but I would say that those combinations and that evolution helps explain where we are today, but by no means was it a linear and direct path or an inevitable one. It took a variety of personalities and interests to, to make it happen. Yes, um, can the, the you need both subjective and objective factors, subjective actual people who do things and the objective, the structural factors that actually provide the conditions for. So I think we're really fortunate over the last two decades, uh, we've had uh, both these elements uh, which have really moved this relationship uh, forward. The last two years, we've seen really the growth of the, the geopolitical convergence, uh, the quad, uh, the first, for the first time, I mean, India is sitting in a large number of institutions with the US uh, and the West. Uh, so we now really seeing a new phase in the in the bilateral security and other cooperation. But uh, to talk about a major problem that's emerging today, the crisis in Ukraine has also the war in Ukraine 
uh, has shown some of the differences between India and the US of how to approach this question. Of course, India has had a historic relationship with Russia. So is the Russia problem going to be a deal breaker for India and the US? Or can India uh, and the United States navigate this crisis? Because the convergence in Asia is real and deep, but the differences over European security are also real. So how do we how do we navigate this potential problem, a real problem today, and how do we transcend it in the in the coming days? Well, it's a very important question. I think the uh, Russian invasion of Ukraine has shown some of the complexities of the U.S.-India relationship, and it is not. The people sometimes think it's an alliance. It is not an yeah. alliance. It is a strategic partnership, uh, and uh, India uh, has a different history. Uh, and geographical position in the United States. And uh, senior members of the US government mm -hmm. understand India's long uh, relationship with first the Soviet Union and then Russia, uh, which uh, as you alluded to in your introductory comments, uh, as the United States during the Cold War leaned a bit toward Pakistan and opened up a relationship with China, India, while well, it had sought at one point uh, uh, weaponry from the United States felt uh, uh, constrained to go to the Soviet Union and in fact even signed a friendship treaty with Moscow in 1971 and has over the years gotten the vast majority of its military equipment from first the Soviet Union, now Russia, uh, estimates of 60 to 70 percent. It certainly relies on Russia for spare parts for that equipment uh, and Russia's also been helpful to India at the United Nations. Uh, it's provided India with uh, constructing nuclear power plants. It provides it with certain technology, nuclear submarines that other countries uh, do not. Uh, and Russia often does this with less conditions than uh, the United States or Western countries might do. So there's a long relationship and, and also of significance, India does not want to push Russia closer to China. It wants to maintain its own a relationship with Russia so that there can be hopefully some daylight uh, between Russia and China. Uh, so that's the background. You now have the Russian invasion of Ukraine. And while some people have said that's a European problem, I, I think that's uh, not the correct lens to view it uh, because it really is, in my opinion, a problem relating to world order and stability. Uh, the Russian invasion violated the basic principles of uh, international relations for the past uh, 70 plus years in which they really unprovoked violated territorial integrity, borders, sovereignty. And this has implications not just for Europe, it has implications for the whole world, including uh, Asia, where some of China's expansionist activity is also not fully respected territorial integrity and borders and, and at times, sovereignty. And so this is something that the United States was hoping that India would be more vocal in uh, uh, speaking out against this, but understands, as I said, the complicated uh, history that India has had with uh, Russia. At this point, however, as a practical matter, I think Russia is going to find itself increasingly isolated politically and economically within the world, and it's going to uh, be unable to, uh, in my view, over time, provide India with the advanced weaponry that it may seek, and it may even be unable to provide all of the spare parts. In fact, some of those spare parts, my understanding is, are, are made in Ukraine uh, overall. And so this is going to put a strain on the relationship. In addition, if India wants to get the most advanced uh, weaponry from the United States, the U.S. is going to have hesitations if that equipment is being mixed with equipment from an adversary, Russia. So there are limitations on the India-Russia relationship that I think will come into focus uh, in the years ahead. And this is going to be an issue for India to navigate. Uh, I know that there is a desire in India that the world be multipolar and that Russia be one of those poles. Uh, and uh, India have the freedom to, to uh, have strong relations with all of the major countries. But I think that as a practical matter, the Russian poll is going to not be too 
uh, long. And uh, India, if they're going to have to deal with the relationship or the uh, challenge from China, and Russia may become increasingly dependent on China, inevitably, I think they're going to have to build up a stronger defense relationship with the United States and some of the other uh, Western countries. Uh, that's going to be a choice for India and how far they go. I don't think it will ever become an alliance, but I think managing that transition of moving away from Russia and perhaps uh, further enhancing the relationship with the United States is going to be uh, a possibility over the next five to 10 years. Uh, I'm quite amazed uh, the way in which the Biden administration I mean, uh, has uh, been, you know, careful to understand exactly the points that you made and, and has, shall we say, I mean, navigated this issue of not letting the differences uh, with India over Russia uh, come in the way of uh, building and expanding the Quad and the, and the larger the larger relationship. Uh, those who are taking a longer view of uh, India-US relationship and India's Russia relationship, uh, Russia in some senses is about India's past. Uh, in a sense, there was a context in the Cold War by, in which it came and the question of China, uh, you know, balancing China with Russia was an important factor. But today, Russia and China are close partners. And for India, the challenge of a unipolar Asia where dominated by China uh, is really a big one. And, and that is not going to be addressed with uh, with Russia, but with the, with the United States. So I think we are in a different context. Those who are a trade, for example, uh, India's trade with Russia, in spite of the recent oil purchases, et cetera, uh, which is uh, which is really a, uh, a, a moment, uh, a, an opportune moment there, but, but not really structural. Uh, if you see India, India, Russia trade is barely $10 billion uh, and it's less than Bangladesh trade, India's trade with Bangladesh. But the India-US trade has dramatically grown. I mean, you remember Bob Blackwell, who came to India as ambassador in 2001, talking about India-US trade it was flat as a chapati. At that time, it was around $20, $20 billion, if I recall right. But today we are at $160 billion. I mean, that's including services. Uh, much of it goes to California, I presume. Uh, and the goods trade, the US is already the largest trading partner. So here is a paradox. The trade volumes have dramatically grown, but so have trade problems. And you, I mean, for you, trade has been a major focus. And uh, I remember when Biden came to India many years ago, he talked about a $500 billion trade relationship between India and the US. So how is it that we made so much progress, but yet, uh, we still there's so much to be done uh, in the bilateral trade relationship. Well, you've really uh, summarized it quite well. The trade relationship has continued to grow. I remember when I was ambassador, uh, my commercial minister said it's never been better, and I sort of said, "But we have all these problems." But he said, "But it's never been better." And so it has grown. And I was under Secretary of Commerce. It was about 19 billion in goods and services. And when I left as ambassador, it was close to 150 billion. And now it's up to 160 billion. And yet for the world's largest and six largest economies, it doesn't fulfill its potential in my view. Uh, and regrettably right now, I worry that uh, both countries are turning a bit inward uh, with the notions of self-reliance, self-sufficiency. Uh, and barriers to trade are being increased in India. The United States has shown no appetite to negotiate bilateral trade agreements. India has. India is uh, negotiating agreements. It concluded one recently with the United Arab Emirates. It's concluded a framework agreement with Australia. It's negotiating with the UK, Canada, the European Union. Uh, and the United States has launched an initiative called the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework. But both countries withdrew from regional trade agreements, which I think is uh, going to create a challenge for them. India had been negotiating for seven years in the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership Agreement. It withdrew uh, at the last minute uh, in uh, a couple of years ago. The United States had been a lead negotiator in the Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement, but it withdrew abruptly at the beginning of uh, the Trump administration. And what's happened is we've ceded the ground to China. Uh, and China views the economic uh, playing field as the one of sort of major competition, and it's been able to dominate. It has, I think, the leading bilateral trade partner with virtually every country 
in Asia. Uh, it is a leading member of the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership Agreement. And surprisingly, it's supplied for the follow-on to the trans pacific Partnership Agreement, the Comprehensive uh, and uh, uh, the CPTPP yep. uh, Agreement uh, uh, and the Comprehensive and Progressive Agreement for Trans-Pacific Partnership. Uh, and they also have their Belt and Road Initiative to try to increase the, really the dependence of other countries in the region on Chinese economic largesse to uh, develop their infrastructure and connectivity. So the United States and India need to look at trade, not just as an economic matter, but as a strategic matter, in my view. Uh, they need to have the political leadership to solve some of their small disputes, but then together try to have the leadership to help structure regionally what trade should look like, especially in emerging areas such as the digital economy, which are going to be critical uh, for both countries. Otherwise, they'll find themselves on the outside looking in as China sets the standards and norms for international trade in the region and ultimately uh, economic growth. So it is an area, uh, as you said, where there's been great progress, but it's also one of unfulfilled potential. And I think it requires not just the trade ministers and the commerce ministers to get involved, but I think the political leadership because it's as strategic as it is economic. You mentioned digital trade. I mean, I'm sure this of special interest to to our California, uh, or, uh, where we've seen uh, there has been an expansion of uh, you know advanced technology cooperation on a range of issues, where the kind of link today that exists between Bangalore, uh, Hyderabad, and Indian side, and Silicon Valley on the on the other, uh, that you were you had a critical role uh, you know when you were dealing with the technology question. You remember uh, we had the whole problem of export controls, uh, technology controls from the from the U.S. side. And how did we overcome that? And, and uh, where do you see uh, beyond the trade question, uh, given the dramatic uh, technological revolution that's unfolding and uh, India's own growing talent and capabilities and the Indians contributing to it uh, in, the, in the United States, uh, how do we leverage this, uh, the emerging revolution? Uh, some, some people call it the fourth industrial revolution or the technological revolution that covers um, artificial intelligence, uh, semiconductors to uh, space uh, to our you know range of areas. So, uh, how do you see this? How do we build on this possibility on the technological side, both the problems in the past as well as the potential for the future? Yeah. Well, as you mentioned, technology has always been a key component of the relationship, and it's how I first got involved as a government official because early on, India wanted increased access to U.S. technology, what's called dual-use technology. Technology has. It has both a civilian and military application. And because of the nuclear tests, a lot of Indian companies had been restricted from being able to gain such access. And so we worked out uh, in the High Technology Cooperation Group and the Next Steps and Strategic Partnership roadmaps for how we could take Indian companies off the entities list and gradually increase India's access to US technology as India built up its own capabilities through export controls uh, and other safeguards to protect that technology and make sure it ended up being used for the purpose it was uh, intended. There was initially resistance to that, uh, but now India is very proud that it's a member of three of the four multilateral export control regimes, the Vosnar arrangement on dual use items, the Australia group on uh, chemical and biological weapons and the missile technology control regime. And it should be in the nuclear suppliers group, but China has stood in the way of its uh, membership. Today, uh, it's much more of a partnership in terms of the potential on technology. Uh, as you've mentioned, India has tremendous talent uh, that goes along with technology. Sometimes the US has a lead in some of the technology, for example, in artificial intelligence, but India has a lot of talent to contribute. And for something like artificial intelligence, data is a big element of that as well, because you need to have big data to analyze in order to build the uh, models for artificial uh, intelligence and the algorithms that you'll use. Uh, and so this is an area of tremendous potential. This two countries have set up cooperative uh, work in this area. I think it's also 
something that the Quad countries want to do, but it goes back to making sure that there is a regime for the digital economy that makes sense. If India's been trying to look at how it's going to protect data, and there's been concerns that it will have restrictions on cross-border use of data, as well as perhaps extensive concerns about the privacy of data. And this, I think, could be a, a hamstring, hamstring the operations of cooperation in this area. So this is something that the United States and India have to make sure that they can bring to bear the technology, the talent, and the data uh, that there are ways, because India feels the data is valuable, ways to monetize that data so that they get individuals get compensated for the use of their data, but that does not overly restrict or handicap uh, technology companies in being able to get the benefits of the cross-border flow of data. But uh, critical and emerging technologies is a huge challenge uh, for the Quad countries in dealing with China's own effort to be strong in this area. And so it's going to take cooperation, uh, not just with the United States and India, but with other countries such as Japan, Australia, and other partners uh, to really work together on all of these technologies. And you mentioned other areas such as space, renewables, uh, semiconductors, and these are ripe areas for cooperation in the years ahead. One of the big changes in the relationship has been growing international cooperation. And we used to remember there was a time when the U.S. counted how many times did India vote against uh, the U.S. in the in the U.N. I mean, probably Russia voted more with the U.S. than India did. Uh, from there, we've come to a point where actually there's a lot more engagement on multilateral global issues. And there, you know, uh, do we see... Uh, this idea of like-minded coalitions, which which the U.S. now talks about, because the traditional multilateralism of the kind that in the, expected from the United Nations, uh, WTO, uh, or the uh, G20, uh, that while those remain important, uh, do we strengthen the like-minded coalitions? I mean, one Quad or uh, G7 plus. So, so is, this is a seemingly a, a major transition in the way the global governance is going to unfold. And a lot of it has to do uh, with the, what you said about technology standards. So in a way, the China's weaponization of multilateral institutions uh, and Russia's full support for China is opened up a new space. So where do you see this, uh, this range of international cooperation? Yeah, well, what's happened uh, over time is that some of the multilateral institutions have simply become less effective. They have broad membership. They often require consensus and they get into a stalemate. And especially now after COVID, there's concern of some countries in terms of who they can rely on, who they cannot rely on for supply chains and issues of that like. And so the notion of trusted partners or like-minded coalitions has gained uh, acceleration in the last uh, few years. And I think that that is a way of dealing with some of the particular challenges we face, whether it be in pandemics or in climate issues or infrastructure and the like, I do think there's a foundational set of issues relating to defense and security where it can't just be a loose, like-minded coalition or just, you know, on this issue, we'll get this group of people, on that issue, we'll get that group of people. If, for example, India has to worry about Chinese behavior on its northern border and whether if the Chinese took an aggressive action, India would be prepared, it's ultimately going to need, in my opinion, uh, assistance from the uh, United States. And that will only happen if there's a greater degree of really coordination of planning, of coordination, of integration. You can't just one day say, hey, send over airplanes and other items uh, if uh, fighting begins. And so I think for the foundational or basic issues of defense and security, you really need to have very close and integrated relationships with some key partners. Whether you call it an alliance or something short of that, you have to have that type of relationship. I think for other types of regional or global issues, you can form these uh, coalitions of the willing, of trusted partners. I think it would be a mistake if countries think that they can all handle everything on their own. I mean. There is this notion today that everyone wants to be the exporter, but not the importer. Uh, 
everyone wants to benefit from a trade agreement or globalization, but not make any compromises. And we're going to have to work these things out and realize that together, trusted partners can achieve more than we can alone uh, and try to be self-reliant or self-sufficient on everything. So we will soon go to the audience for questions. So please send in your questions. And uh, before that, I had one last question in, in our uh, general discussion. Uh, uh, it is about the, the, you know, both Americans and Indians, you want to put a label on the relationship. I mean, say uh, allied or non-allied or allied, uh, you know, so th this, this problem of definition, uh, sometimes, as you know, uh, you served in the government, sometimes the labels actually complicate things. So you said, look, India and US are not going to be allies or not allies now in an allies in a very technical definition, but they're doing a lot more things together. So how do you see this, uh, uh, the, the question of, uh, can we be stronger partners as two large countries and India eventually will become the third largest economy that can we find a framework that is different from the kind of historic framework the US had with the European Europeans and the Northeast Asians on uh, classical alliances. So is there, a, is there a middle path somewhere there for us to work out a relationship uh, that, that kind of is different in its terms of engagement, uh, yet does a lot of things together? That's an excellent question. Uh, and I think some of this is gonna be up to India because I think the United States, uh, as you've mentioned, there is bipartisan consensus on uh, the benefits of a strong US-India relationship and of a strong India uh, in the Indo-Pacific uh, region. Uh, I think there is historically been a reluctance of India coming out of its colonial past to be in a alliance where it feels it is subservient to another country's wishes. And India was, as you know, a leader of the non-aligned movement and speaks more recently of strategic autonomy. Uh, but I think that as I was indicating in my last answer, India has to decide and the Russian issue is one area where this comes up, do they wanna have strong equidistant relationships with all key countries and be able to have issue oriented uh, coalitions or do they need at some fundamental level, whether you call it an alliance or a strategic partnership but some greater integration with a few key players that will make sure that its defense and security are adequate, at least until India is able to develop the indigenous capabilities in the military area to do this on its own. And countries may never be able to do it all on their own. Uh, you, you have strength and partners. So we ought not get hung up on the uh, labels. Uh, we ought to understand the complexities of the relationship, but I do think it's sort of more going to be India than the United States that determines the speed and depth of what uh, occurs. In some respects, you're pushing on an open door. Uh, and uh, I do think that uh, it will take time. None of these things happen quickly, but I hope that we can have a tighter defense planning and relationship as exigencies arise in the Indo-Pacific uh, and elsewhere. But uh, this is really what's gonna be critical of the next five to 10 years is how is this gonna be navigated? And as you say, how do you handle the public relations of it as well as the internal governmental uh, interactions uh, about uh, these issues? So can we, we have a number of questions uh, coming in. So uh, I'll begin with some which we didn't address in our, in our, in our conversation. Uh, one is about uh, the uh, question of environmental change, uh, how do we work together? Uh, we've seen certainly under the Modi government from saying this is not our problem, we didn't create it, you guys did it, the developed countries, uh, you do the solution as well, to one where actually uh, there's been a conscious effort under PM Modi to, to say, look, India will be part of the answer uh, and that India will work together with the... So where do you see that going I mean, in terms of both the US debate as well as uh, the potential for cooperation between India and the US on, on working out new rules, developing new technologies? Because it can't simply be done by negotiations you know, in, a, you know, in a grand setting, but you need new technologies, you need new ways of uh, rearranging the relationship between economy and energy. So where do you see that uh, uh, potential for cooperation between India and the US? 
Well, the, you know, the energy partnership between our two countries has grown enormously over the last uh, four or five years. That's one of the things I look back on during my tenure as ambassador with great pride that we really became a leading energy provider for India and enhanced India's energy security. Uh, everyone recognizes that the transition to renewables uh, is important and would happen sooner than later. But we also have to be realistic and acknowledge that it's not going to occur overnight and it's a transition process. One of the things that uh, India can do is increase its imports of natural gas. And we've had a natural gas task force that we worked on. We're working on looking at hydrogen uh, as an energy source. Uh, but uh, recognizing the enormous economic growth challenges that India and China face, we have to accept that there will still be the use of fossil fuels for uh, uh, several years to come. So we have to look not just at renewables, but how do we increase the ability to have clean carbon, carbon capture, and other ways to make the fossil fuel use uh, more efficient, as I said, a transition more to natural gas. These are all areas that we can and should cooperate on. We have to do it realistically. We also have to work on adaptation and recognizing that uh, some of climate change uh, may occur regardless of efforts that are made and that may have consequences for coastal areas and how do you adapt and work on that. But this is an area of great discussion between our two countries. One of the issues that India and some of the developing countries do request is funding for their commitments. And this has been a difficult area for uh, all the Western countries to come up with the resources to support that. So that will be another issue and challenge uh, for both countries. But as you said, the discussion, like most issues in US-India relations, Day to day, the discussions can sometimes be challenging, but when you step back and look at where they were five years ago and where they are today, a tremendous amount uh, is accomplished. And I would say that is the case in terms of energy and environmental cooperation. One of the issues uh, which has been raised in the in the uh, question box uh, was the, you know, the seeming hypocrisy in a sense. The Europe continues to import Russian oil. In fact, in a way. Uh, Europe's dependence on Russia, uh, Russian oil and natural gas is huge, while there's a lot of criticism of India. But I thought the administration was far more, Biden administration was far more careful in how it frames the issue. And in fact, uh, uh, it is today talking about working together to deal with the problem because it's the energy crisis has hit not just India, but a whole lot of countries, developing countries. So that's one part, I mean, that, that we need to address the problem. How do you cut revenues to Russia without uh, choking off oil supplies because uh, to, the, to the rest of the developing world, including, including India? So that's one part of it. The second part was US-India doing more on the energy front. I mean, recently, uh, ExxonMobil has signed an agreement with, uh, with the ONGC, the Oil and Natural Gas uh, Corporation of India, which does the exploration, a cooperation on exploration, because India's internal exploration of its maritime and uh, land territories. Uh, we need to do more finding oil uh, on our own territory. And I think this partnership between ExxonMobil and uh, India, that's the kind of thing we need to do, find actual practical solutions rather than simply argue about the conditions under which we deal with the problem. You got a lot of uh, different points in that question. Uh, you know, on, on, first on dealing with uh, Russia and oil imports, the argument in the West is that Europe, while they're ex importing a substantial amount of uh, energy from Russia, is gradually seeking to lower that. And the concern is that India is increasing its volume of exports, of imports. But at the same time, the total amount of Indian imports is infinitesimal relative to that in Europe. And it's very tough, in my opinion, for the uh, other countries to complain about India when they're still importing a substantial amount from Russia. Over time, we're going to have to all, if the war keeps up and uh, Russia is committing atrocities, work our way to lowering uh, imports from them. And as you said, uh, we're now discussing different ways of managing that situation. I was involved 
when I was in the State Department during the first Bush administration, George H.W. Bush, and putting together the Gulf War coalition. And we recognized that the sanctions on Iraq were going to have a detrimental impact on a variety of countries. And we sought to offset the sanction impact with other measures. And that's what we've got to do here as well as sanctions are being imposed. It's had collateral damage. And uh, the countries imposing the sanctions have to work with those countries experiencing the collateral damage to figure out ways to lessen that if you want to make the sanctions effective uh, over time. So these are all areas that are ripe for discussion. They may become more acute if the war uh, in Russia's invasion of Ukraine continues uh, uh, for uh, a long time, as it may well. And there may be, as you said, issues of food shortages, fertilizer shortages, other commodity issues, as well as energy. But this is one of the collective problems that uh, we have to address. We didn't discuss too much on the latest developments uh, occurring in Asia, especially in relation to Taiwan. Uh, so I have a question on that. I mean, uh, uh, what would be the, what are the kind of, you know, the crisis is building up, uh, you know, India generally had tried to stay away from uh, one China policy, you know, given its commitment to one China policy. Uh, what we've seen some interesting developments in the last uh, few days. Uh, India is not no longer reaffirming its one China policy. Yeah, certainly uh, since uh, its own problems with China on the border have increased. Uh, and at the same time, India can't join the US uh, and see Japan and the other quad partners in denouncing China when itself is fighting you know, has uh, almost uh, 60,000 soldiers uh, standing for a second winter uh, at the 14,000 feet in the in the high Himalayas. So on the Taiwan question, which has potential to hugely destabilize the region, uh, uh, how do we expand the engagement between India and the US? And uh, what are the expectations in Washington of India? Well, again, this is a very complicated issue. You know, the premise behind the one China policy is that any changes uh, in China's relationship, mainland China's relationship with Taiwan will occur peacefully. Uh, and some of that now has been undercut by China's own actions in Hong Kong, where it uh, violated its uh, commitments in terms of uh, you know, one country, two systems uh, in Hong Kong. No one is looking for Taiwan to declare independence and create a, uh, a clash with China. But also, uh, no one wants to see China try to uh, incorporate Taiwan by force. Uh, and therefore, uh, people recognize, uh, especially in terms of what's happening in Russia, Ukraine, what are the lessons that we need to take and how do we try to make clear to the Chinese that they need to negotiate uh, a solution with Taiwan and work on trying to peacefully resolve that issue over time and not consider the use of force. At the same time, the Chinese seem to have made clear by President Xi that uh, he's not going to leave incorporation of Taiwan into the mainland China for the next generation. It's an issue that he wants to solve uh, during his tenure. Uh, and so, again, the next five to 10 years are going to be very critical. My assumption is that China doesn't seek a conflict at this time, but it's certainly trying to build up its military capabilities if it chooses to have a conflict in five or 10 years from now. And other countries have to figure out what they need to do uh, relative to Taiwan and their own commitments and capabilities to try to indicate to the Chinese that any military action would be a, a mistake. Uh, and this is something that we should be discussing with our partners. Uh, and it has been noted that India has taken a slightly uh, more nuanced position uh, recently. Uh, there uh, is an opportunity for increased India-Taiwan trade, uh, as there is in the United States. Uh, and we'll have to see how that plays out. But it's part of the dynamic elements of uh, this region. And it's why, as I said it, earlier, you can't look at the Russian invasion of Ukraine as an isolated activity. It sort of has broader ramifications for some of the changes going on in the world more broadly. And uh, it should not 
give China license to feel that it can now take military action against Taiwan in the same way that Russia is doing against Ukraine. Now, talking about one China policy uh, and uh, the recent visit of Speaker Pelosi uh, to uh, to Taiwan, there's uh, generally there's a lot of focus in the U.S. on the complex U.S. position uh, in relation to Taiwan. But there is also Tibet, uh, which is equally problematic. And uh, uh, Speaker Nancy Pelosi has also been uh, a, a great uh, champion of uh, Tibet and uh, uh, and Tibet's rights uh, within China. So here, and then if you look at the Tibet as, a, as an issue, we see gathering storm clouds. We have, as I said, 60,000 troops. They're locked in a fight uh, in, uh, in the high Himalayas, in the Ladakh sector. We have uh, recently uh, His Holiness Dalai Lama went to Ladakh, uh, which is again, you know, the, the dispute between India and China over Ladakh is also sharpened politically and diplomatically. And then India and the US are doing exercises close to the China border. So you have, is this issue, there was a time when Tibet issue seemed to dominate uh, Washington's thinking. Uh, is it still a live issue in the US uh, or is it something really that pales into, you know, relative uh, obscurity given what else is happening uh, in the world? No, I think it's still a live issue. I mean, I, you know, a lot of people don't understand the US system. And when they think when the speaker of the house uh, travels to a foreign country, it's done necessarily in coordination with the administration. It's not the case. And I think ideally the Biden administration probably would not have wanted Speaker Pelosi to go to Taiwan or to be provocative on Tibet because they realize this is a sensitive time with China with the party Congress going to convene later this year to potentially uh, give President Xi an unprecedented third term. Uh, and yet the speaker did that because these are live issues and there is a strong American commitment to uh, the Tibetans, uh, to preserving Tibetan culture. There's a significant uh, appropriation that occurs every year to provide assistance uh, to the Tibetans. Uh, this is also, as you know, a, a, a hist uh, has a long history with India and really is perhaps the source of some of the India-China problems, but I think there is great sensitivity to Tibet, to what's going on with the Uyghurs in the northwest of China, and to Taiwan. And so all of these issues uh, are coming together, and it's why uh, there is accelerated activity among the Quad countries uh, and uh, continued strengthening of the U.S.-India partnership. This is the most dynamic region of the world, and yet it's one that's undergoing a tremendous amount of change. The tectonic plates of stability are, are shifting around and uh, we'll have to see again, hopefully uh, the, there'll be leaders going back to your initial question in all of these countries that will rise to the occasion and, and uh, address these issues in a collective and uh, thoughtful way. There's one question on Japan uh, that, uh, you know, the sense that, look, Japan is passive. I mean, that's the general perception of Japan as, as a passive uh, player. Uh, can we get Japan to do more? But actually, if you look at the last uh, 15 years, uh, on the especially on the Indo-Pacific construct, it was really Japan that developed the idea. Initially, both Delhi and Washington had cold feet. Uh, it's really Japan has already taken the intellectually, surprisingly, I mean, I would say, uh, in the last uh, decade to really build the Indo-Pacific as a as a as a geopolitical construct, and in the and since Ukraine, I mean, it's quite staggering to see the kind of changes Japan wants to do, strengthen its own military capability, strengthen deterrence vis-a-vis -vis China, uh, to do more with uh, India and other Asian countries, to build regional partnerships. We're already members of the Quad. India has a special relationship with Japan. Uh, how do you see uh, the Japanese role in shaping India-U.S. partnership uh, in the next uh, few years? Well, it goes back to your initial question on leadership and on structural interests. And again, Japan's had a bit of both. Prime Minister Abe was critical in the whole concept of the Indo-Pacific in a speech he made in 2007 uh, to the uh, Indian parliament. Uh, and uh, he has really uh, tried to reorient Japan a bit uh, to being more concerned about its security and being a little more forward-leaning, despite its constitutional limitations on what it uh, can do. 
Uh, and uh, you also see now the interest of Japan. China has given its uh, difficulty in the East China Seas, and uh, they're concerned about what China is doing in its exercises relative to Taiwan and its activity. And so Japan has been very important in uh, energizing the Quad, uh, in developing a much stronger relationship with India. I think uh, that's been critical in the last several years. You see Japan providing uh, a lot of assistance in the northeastern states uh, in India. Uh, and we now see military exercises. The Malabar exercise is, uh, you know, often was a three country exercise with Japan, United States, and India. It's expanded to Australia. So Japan has become a very dynamic and important player. In Australia, by the way, you didn't ask about this, but has become much more uh, active uh, in the last several years, in part because of what China has done in Australia, sought to question what the origins were of COVID-19. The uh, Chinese uh, hit them with all sorts of sanctions, and the Australians have said, we don't like that, and have stood up. And so uh, Chinese activity, along with leadership in these countries, has accelerated the degree of cooperation among Quad members. And I think you'll see Quad plus uh, groupings as well uh, in uh, dealing with uh, the range of challenges uh, that are going to be on the radar over the next few years. No, thanks. Uh, uh, thanks for that question. I think uh, my time is running out and uh, I'll go back to Margaret. But before that, I just wanted to say the, to thank you again for the stimulating conversation. Uh, we've not been able to touch on all the issues. Uh, there are questions about the domestic politics in both the countries. But what is uh, significant, I thought, looking at the last 20 years, I mean, there are no shortage of people uh, who are pessimistic about the relationship at any given time. Uh, what is what stands out is how India-U.S. relationship has defined has defied gravity. Uh, the pessimism at every time would say, "Look, this can't go further." But yet we kept moving forward, and and we have a relationship which I think the cup is more than half full. And the question is, uh, in the next few years, how do we take it, make it more fuller, uh, and do the uh, progress towards the fuller realization of the partnership? I, I agree with you completely. India and the, uh, and the United States. Yeah, no, so I, I, I fully agree with you, and it's been a pleasure chatting with, with you about these issues, Raja. Give it back to you, Margaret. Thank you for that optimistic close, Ambassador Jester and Professor Mohan. It was wonderful marking India's 75th anniversary with you as we keep an eye on all these tectonic shifts happening in the region and the world. We are sure that Naren Gupta would be very pleased with the conversation. This program and series is dedicated to him and his legacy. Ambassador, please come visit us in San Francisco. Professor, congratulations on your Delhi launch. And for our audience, please check out our Asia Society Northern California website for the complete list of our upcoming programs. We have events coming up on data and ethical AI in Southeast Asia, Asian American histories, entrepreneurship, supply chains, and much, much more. We're hosting weekly events in person in San Francisco and Silicon Valley and virtually for our global audience. If you're not a member, please join us. If you'd like to sponsor, please reach out. The video for this event will be available in about a week. And for those joining our VIP reception, click on that second Zoom link that was emailed to you before the program. We're going to continue an off-the-record discussion with our speakers. Thank you to our team, Natalie Despiglier, Rexel Uwe, Nina Udagawa, and all of our interns and volunteers. And from all of us at the Asia Society Northern California Center, thank you for joining us. <laughs>